The reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 24, the verse, first 12 verses. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them, who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the woman, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen living, lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Thank you, Stuart, and good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many people here today. It's a special, special day. So, as it says, Easter Sunday, He is risen. He is risen indeed. We'll, we'll get there. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have the hope that is assured through the resurrection of Jesus. Father, this life is not all we have. We have so much more to look forward to. Father, I pray that as your word is shared today, your spirit would move in our midst, that you would speak to hearts in the way you alone know you need to speak. Father, we commit this time to you. We pray you'd be glorified through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Di. I want to begin by sharing a story of a little boy named Philip. Philip was a five-year-old boy who received his first pet kitten. That was a newborn, it was jet black with little white feet, probably something similar to this. Oh, isn't it cute? Melt your heart. You can see how the white paws stand in stark contrast to the rest of its body. It looks like it's walked through white paint. So what they did is they gave the name Boots to this little kitten. Now, Philip, he adored Boots. He doted on this cat. He loved spending time with it. He watched as it began to develop and grow. As a family, they made a decision that Boots would live indoors for six weeks. Now, the family had this enclosed porch you know, where it was screened off, and so Boots was free to explore. And like many other house cats, Boots would sit and watch the outside world. Now, six weeks came and went, and the decision was made to let Boots venture out and experience life in the big, wide world. And that six-week day, six date coincided with Easter Sunday, so this was the date the family set. So on the morning of Easter Sunday, Boots steps outside for the first time, she walks along in the grass, she, you know, sticks her nose into the daffodil, she's sniffing around. She sees and chases her very first butterfly, running and jumping, flicking her little white paws at it as she's going along. Everything's going swimmingly. Later that day, Philip and his family were hosting an Easter egg hunt. This is when the unthinkable happened. All of the neighborhood kids had been invited, the next-door neighbor, he showed up with his Boston Terrier named Pugs. Now, 
This is a Boston Terrier. Pugs took one look at Boots and he just charged. And before anyone had a chance to react, Pugs had Boots by the neck between his teeth. And here was Pugs just shaking this poor little kitten around like it was some old raggedy doll. Naturally, all the kids began to scream and shout. They're doing whatever they can to distract Pugs to get him to somehow release this quite vicious grip that he has on poor Boots. Finally, Pugs has had enough fun and he drops this limp little kitten to the ground. Philip goes over. He picks up Boots. He then realized that whatever life had been in that kitten, it's now vanished. Boots was dead. Philip was five years old, but he'd learnt a lot. Through Sunday school, he learned about a God who could heal and do miraculous things. And so he prayed and he prayed and he agonized over this kitten. He prayed, please God, use your power to bring Boots back. As the days passed, he went over and over in his mind about what had happened. And he'd wake up and think, maybe this was just a bad dream. Or maybe somehow it could all be undone. It could be erased or rewound or something like that. And yet it was this day, Easter Sunday, that Philip learned the, the, the hard and cruel truth of what we know as irreversibility. There are some things that cannot be undone. Boots was dead. She wasn't coming back. Now all of us here have experienced something of that irreversibility, yes? We know the pain of saying a word in jest. Perhaps you're just joking with a friend. And yet we say something, and the second it comes out of our mouth, we know it's going to cut to the heart of that person. It's going to cause offense. We meant it in jest. And before we can take those words back, they're already gone. They've been said, and we can't take them back. Or maybe there's been a relationship where there's been neglect and there's been hurt. And things have been said and done, and there's been no healing. There's been no mending of this hurt that's been caused. There's been no reconciliation. And as a consequence, things have just drifted further and further apart. And then you find yourself at this point where the relationship is so broken that it's beyond repair. It can't be restored. And then there's death. There's nothing as final as death. In 2013, we returned full-time as a family to South Sudan. Now, the principal of the Bible college where we served, he was also named Philip. Now, we'd known Philip for a very, very long time. That's Philip with his wife, Lydia. Can you see the water in the background there? That's the River Nile. We lived right on the River Nile. In the background, you can see the huts. Okay, this is Africa. They, that was the student accommodation. We actually lived in a house, but that's not far from where we lived. Now, we'd only been back a, a few months, I think probably two or three months at best, I was teaching a class one day, and what I heard was this group of ladies wailing. It was this, you know, this sickening thing to hear. It's this shrieking that pierces the silence. You know, these anguished screams. They just convey this message of fear and dread. What had happened was Philip had collapsed, and he'd been rushed to the local hospital. It took me about 30 minutes to walk there. On the way, I called a colleague who also lived on site with us, but at the time, he was in Kenya with his family. I told him what happened, and I, just, I said, could you please ask people to pray for Philip? By the time I arrived at the hospital, Philip was dead. He was already zipped up in this white body bag. Now, as the only white person there, the hospital staff, they assumed, you must be some kind of expert. You must know more than us. We have an expression in Africa that says, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. You may not know everything, but you must know more than us. So what they said is, can you please unzip this bag and make sure that he's really dead? Now, I, I'll be honest, I didn't really know what I was doing. And so what I did is I checked for a pulse as best as I could. Can I tell you, Philip was lifeless. I left that hospital in a state of complete shock. The suddenness of everything, it just hit me like a brick. As I walked back to our campus, I called my colleague in Kenya. His name was Eli. All I could say is, is Eli, and, and, and understand, I'm choking back the emotion. I could barely find the words. I simply said, Philip hadn't made it. Just like that, he was gone. A man that I'd seen only the day before, he was gone and he wasn't coming back. 
How do you deal with the irreversibility of death? How do you cope with its finality? Does death just go unchecked and swallow everything in its path? Does death get to have the final say? Where's the hope in this? We're looking today at the Easter story. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're remembering today. We're thinking through, what does it mean to us? What does it offer us? Now understand, the disciples knew something of this irreversibility. They knew something of the suddenness of having someone so violently stripped away from them. Remember, it's Sunday. On Thursday night, Jesus and his disciples, what did they do? They gathered together in this upper room to celebrate the Passover feast. And no doubt the disciples had high hopes of Jesus doing what Yahweh had done when he delivered his people from Egypt. They're hoping that at this moment in Jerusalem, Jesus is going to publicly reveal himself as Messiah. And what he's going to do is he's going to set us free from the cruel hand of the Romans. That's their hope. And yet sometime between Thursday night and Friday morning, Jesus has been arrested. He's been tried. He's been beaten. He's been placed on a Roman cross. By early Friday afternoon, Jesus was dead. A Pharisee by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, he's requested the body. He took it to a new tomb and placed it in there. The disciples, they're nowhere to be seen. They've scattered, they've fled, they're fearing for their lives, they're now in hiding. You can imagine them cowering behind closed doors. They're thinking, Master is gone. He's been arrested, he's been crucified, and maybe we're next. We need to hide, we need to get out of there. The tomb where Jesus' body was laid, they secured it with a large stone, and it was sealed by the Roman authorities. What this means is that if anyone tampers with that seal, you're going to have to answer to the might of Rome. You don't tamper with that or you're going to end up like the person inside that tomb. That was understood. See, the disciples, they knew all about the despair and pain of irreversibility. Jesus was dead and that was that. They know what you and I know, that dead people remain dead. Now it's true that some Jews did believe in the resurrection of the dead, but only at the end of the age. We see this reflected in John chapter 11. Jesus says to Martha, the brother of Lazarus, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, yes, Jesus, I know. He will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. As you read the Easter stories, you see they weren't expecting this miracle of Jesus rising from the dead. The hopes and dreams they had for Jesus the Messiah, they didn't relate to some distant point in the future. They related to the here and now. We want Jesus to act. We want Jesus to deliver. That's our expectation. That's our hope. But Jesus was dead. And so too were their expectations. They accepted this irreversibility of Jesus' death on the cross. And yet something happened. Something happened that transformed them. They went from being this fearful, scared bunch of men hiding behind closed doors in their rooms to suddenly standing in the streets boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus. Even to the point of getting whipped and flogged. And so you ask yourself, what happened? What change took place that caused them to go from being scared little church mice to being bold and defiant? The answer is simple. The resurrection of Jesus. They met the risen Christ. And you see how it shaped not only their lives, but also their message. In Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching, and this is what he tells the people. Now remember, this is only 50 days after Jesus has died. So if people don't believe them, they can go and check the, the, the tomb, produce a body. Peter says this, God raised him from the dead, freeing him, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Later on, he goes on to say, 
Jesus was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised him to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. Later, Peter and John, they're on trial before the Sanhedrin. This is the same group of people who considered Jesus worthy of death, condemned him to death. They're standing before them, and they say this. Know this, you and all the people of Israel, you crucified Jesus of Nazareth, but God raised him from the dead. And you see this over and over and over again. This is the apostolic testimony in the book of Acts. You go through Acts, you listen to them preach. They don't preach the cross, they preach the empty tomb. Jesus is alive. That's their proclamation. We heard in our reading today that when the angels appeared to the women on that third day, they explained to them, don't you remember? Have you forgotten? Jesus himself told you that he must suffer and die and rise again on this, the third day. Now when the women report this, they go back to the disciples, they say, hey, the, the, the stone's been rolled away, the tomb is empty. And what does Luke write? He says this, the disciples did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense to them. Can you see the resurrection was not a miracle they expected? It's nonsense. Dead people stay dead. They don't rise from the grave. That's what they're thinking. That's their expectation. So what we have now in this apostolic preaching is words that seem like nonsense to them now form the very heart of the thing they bear witness to. So there's no denying it. Jesus had risen. That's the only way to account for their change in behavior. They've gone from cowardice and denial to boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus. The Apostle Paul would later go on and write these words. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is it's empty. It's futile. Your faith is worthless and meaningless if Christ has not been raised. And all those who have fallen in, asleep in Christ, they're lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, pity us more than all people. We're fools to be despised. Make no mistake, they staked everything on the resurrection. Everything rises and falls on the resurrection of Jesus. This is the thing that held them together. This was the thing that made all the difference. It shaped their lives and it shaped their message. I like what Chuck Colson said. This is Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson was a presidential aide to Richard Nixon. He was one of the conspirators who was sent to prison for his part in the Watergate scandal. He became a born-again Christian during his time inside, hence the, the name of the book. At a press conference after his release, he was asked this question. What do we learn from Watergate? What lessons can we learn? That's what the press corps are asking Chuck Colson. And here's what he said. He said, we learn that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead. They're looking at him, they're puzzled, and they're thinking, what? What does Jesus Christ have to do with Watergate? And Colson said, it's very simple. Watergate proves that nobody will die for a lie. He then explained, I know that the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proves it to me. Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured it if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. You see, the minute the Watergate scandal began to unravel, when they got caught, they're denying it. Richard Nixon says, no one from my administration was involved in this sordid affair. Deny, lie, and hide. But the minute it began to get undone, unraveled, they all began to confess and arrange deals where they could save their own skins. I'll fess up to anything so long as it doesn't mean so much time in prison. 
I'm involved, I'm caught red-handed, I did it. Why? Because no one's prepared to take a, a fall for a lie. There's a Kenyan pastor by the name of Eliud Simeu. That's him there. He claims to be Jesus. He's got a very large following. He's got a very large following. He once claimed to turn water into tea. Now, African Christians, you don't drink wine, so what do you do? You drink tea. So he turned water into tea. That's his claim. Last Easter, last year, this time last year, some of his followers, what they wanted to do was crucify him to see him rise again on the third day. <laughs> You're Jesus. You can do what Jesus did. We'll kill you and you'll rise again. That will prove the claim is true. What did he do? He ran to the police station for protection. Why? Because he's not prepared to die for a lie. What we see with the 12 apostles and others, not just the 12, but others, is that they're prepared to stake their life upon this claim that Jesus has risen from the dead. Why? Because they trusted that the one who raised Jesus from the dead would also raise them one day as well. That was their hope. That in the resurrection of Jesus, death itself had been defeated. Where, O oh, death, is your sting, Paul would later say. Death has been swallowed up in the death of Jesus Christ. That's what they understood. Peter Kreeft is a philosophy professor. He put it this way. Why would the apostles lie? Liars always lie for selfish reasons. If they lied, what was their motive? What did they get out of it? What they got out of it was misunderstanding, rejection, persecution, torture, and martyrdom. Hardly a list of perks. No one's going to lie or die for a lie, yeah? It's not worth it. Think also about the story of James, the brother of Jesus. James became a great leader in the early church. What we know is that around 62 AD, he was put to death. He was stood before a group of people. He was asked to testify about his life. So what does he do? I'm not going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about Jesus. And then they said to him, will you deny Jesus? And his reply was, no, no, I won't. And they beat him to death on the spot because he refused to say that Jesus is just some ordinary man. Now, the thing that's interesting about James is that he was born of Joseph and Mary. Okay? He grew up with Jesus. And what we see in the gospel accounts is that when Jesus begins his ministry, his brothers and sisters, they're not with him, they're against him. This guy's not the Messiah. He's not the one he claims to be. And what do they do? They try to dissuade him. At one point, they even confess that he's out of his mind. He's loco. He's crazy, man. It's like you know, Monty Python. He's not the Messiah. He's just a naughty boy, as they say. But they think he's definitely not the one through whom the hopes of Israel will come. He's not the Messiah. So what's happened? It's only after Easter that you see James become this strong leader in the church. It's only after Easter that, that James is willing to die for this understanding that Jesus is the one he claimed to be. He met the risen Christ. That's what happened. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, Paul provides a list of all of those people to whom Jesus has appeared. He appeared to the eleven. And then to 500. And what does James do? He singles, sorry, what does Paul do? He singles out James. He says the 11 or the 12, 500, and then James. And once Jesus has appeared to his brother James, from that point on, everything is different. I've met the risen Christ. He is indeed the one he claims to be. C.H. Dodd was an English theologian. He wrote these words. The resurrection is not a belief that grew up within the church. It is the belief around which the church itself grew up. Now understand what he's saying. He's saying that the apostles didn't invent this idea of the resurrection after their hopes for Jesus had died at the cross. Jesus is not the king we thought he would be, so let's just invent the resurrection and build everything around that. No, that's not what happened. The resurrection was their hope. 
It was the thing that made their faith real. It was the thing that gave them confidence. It gave them boldness. And it gave them insurance. Why? Because when they looked at Jesus and what he'd become in his body, this body that had conquered death, they realized that they too would one day be like him. That they too would one day conquer death and be raised to life in a glorious, imperishable body. And what they did is they took that hope to the grave. They saw the risen Christ and they came to realize that the very thing we think is irreversible is indeed not final. Amen? Can I tell you, this is the same confidence I see when I sit with Nola Dines. We don't know how long Nola's got left. But when I sit with her, what I see and what I sense is this confident trust that death is not final. It's not arrogance. It's not blind faith. It's this reassured peace that her Savior's defeated the grave and that death does not have the final say. It may be staring her in the face, but she knows death does not have the final word and that she too one day will rise like Jesus did as well. That's hope is just emanating from her. It's an amazing thing. And so I wonder, do you, do you share that same hope? This hope that God is not going to allow death to have the final word. This hope that says that God will indeed bring about the purposes he has for his people. There's a wonderful passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says this. We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. Please say hallelujah. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Amen. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying the things that grieve our hearts, the things that bring us in tears to our knees, these things are only temporary. This is the hope the resurrection brings. That these things are not forever. They don't have the final say. Do you have this hope? Paul is saying all that we suffer, all that we endure, the resurrection says these things are only temporary. The glory that awaits us far outweighs it all. So much so that Paul can say everything you go through, he doesn't trivialize it, he simply puts it into perspective. It is light and momentary. That's the hope of the resurrection. One of my favorite authors is a man named Philip Yancey. He's an American journalist turned Christian writer. He's a very good storyteller. He tells a story about his wife, Janet. He said she once worked in an aged care facility in, uh, in Chicago. Now, apparently, of all the residents in this nursing home, she said half were white and the other half were, were black. And he said they're, they're all in their 80s and 90s, and they all live with this constant awareness of death. He said every day they'd wake up and their bodies remind them of this fact. Okay, death is at the door. Yet Philip Yancey's wife, Janet, she noticed a striking difference in the way each group faced death. Let me read it the way he writes. He says this. As they aged and neared death, many of Janet's white clients became increasingly more fearful and uptight. They complained about their lives, their families, and their failing health. The blacks, in contrast, maintained a good humor and triumphant spirit, even though most of them have more apparent reason for bitterness and despair. Most of had lived in the South just one generation after slavery, and had suffered a lifetime of economic oppression and injustice. Many of them were senior citizens before the first civil rights bills were passed. What causes the difference in outlooks? Janet concluded that the answer is hope, a hope that traces directly to the blacks' bedrock belief in eternity. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through, they'd say. These words and other words like them, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. These words from the Negro spirituals came out of a tragic period of history when everything in this world looked bleak. But somehow black churches managed to instill a vivid belief in a life beyond this one. 
If you want to hear up-to-date images of the world to come, attend a few black funerals. The preachers paint word pictures of a life so serene and sensuous that everyone in the congregation starts fidgeting to go there. The mourners feel grief, naturally, but in its proper place, as an interruption, a temporary setback in a battle whose end has already been determined. It is, of course, wrong to use heaven as an excuse to avoid relieving poverty and misery here on earth. But is it not equally wrong to deny an authentic hope in heaven for someone whose life is ending. I find this fascinating. The ones to whom life has dealt the harshest hands, the ones who have suffered more than anyone else, they're the ones who live with this hope of the resurrection from the dead. Despite all the injustice they've suffered, despite all the poverty they've endured, despite the temptation to think that maybe God's forgotten us in our plight, despite all of this, They had this hope that gave life. This hope that grows faith. This hope that has an answer to the finality of death. This hope that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I ask you again, do you know this hope? Do you know it? Let me close with this story that comes from a time when the communists ruled the Eastern Bloc countries. Story goes, a Christian minister was sitting in an audience when a Russian man began lecturing in what is now the the Czech Republic, or Czechia as they call it, was then known as Czechoslovakia. This Russian man is lecturing on all the reasons why Jesus could have not risen from the dead. For five hours he's going on and on. It's impossible for anyone to rise from the dead. That was his argument. He's argued this for five long hours. At this point, the minister says, I've heard enough. So he walks up to the platform and he tapped the Russian man on the shoulder and he said, do you mind if I give a rebuttal to what you just said? And the Russian man looks at him, you know, know your place, man. But he said, okay, you can give your rebuttal, but I'm only going to give you five minutes. This man's already taken five hours and he's only going to allow five minutes. The minister took one look back at the Russian. He said, don't worry, I won't need that long. And he stood before this group of people. He looked at his hands. And he said to them, this famous Easter greeting, Christ is risen. And with one voice, the people responded, He is risen indeed. The minister then turned to the Russian man and said, that's all I wanted to say. And he sat down. Do you carry this same hope in your heart? This hope that carries you through life. This hope that carries your faith. This hope that carries you through death and into eternity. The hope of the resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Don't jump the gun. I wanted to close with us doing that together one time. I'm going to say the first part. You can say the second part with a little more gusto this time, eh? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Wow. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. What a special weekend we've had to sit as your people. We remembered the cross on Friday. All the filth, all the junk, all that corruption inside of our hearts has been carried by Christ, our sin bearer. We've been cleansed, we've been washed, we've been redeemed, made holy by His blood as your people. And Father, it's not just a hope for helping us to live a better life here and now. It's a hope that says death has been defeated. The grave has been overcome. Death has lost its sting. That our light and momentary troubles... What lies beyond is an eternal glory that far outweighs everything. Father, we thank you for the hope that the resurrection gives us. That this life is not all we have. That something far better waits in store for those who love you. Father, we thank you for resurrection hope. We pray that its power would cause us to live lives that honor and glorify you. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name.
Amen.